proper introduction for you for you and, and your background. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, certainly. First of all, thank you for having me on the show. Apparently, I'm a junkie. I keep coming back. So thank you so much. What you guys are putting out there is really powerful. And so I am honored to be on here and help contribute. And so what I do for those listening is I work with marriages and really I'm bringing the fun back, the adventure back into marriage through teaching you practical skills and ways of interacting, but then also helping you to really transform from the inside out because we're not interested in behavior modification. And that's what happens a lot of times when we go for marriage counseling, coaching, whatever you want to call it, we get better for a time for a time period but then eventually we go back to how we used to be and part of that is because we've changed our behavior in the interim but we haven't really changed what we believe about what we're doing and how we're interacting and so that's why those don't stick so i'm interested in having it stick because i believe the person the couple they have what it takes to have a fulfilling relationship we just got to help them to get there yeah, I love the idea of changing not just your behavior, but your beliefs. Mm -hmm. and, and and you mentioned transformation. And that is what Team 212 is. Literally, 212. Somebody asked me yesterday, what does 212 mean? And I said, transformation. Because at 211, you know, water boils. But at 212, it turns into steam. And that tr completely transforms the molecule. And yeah. and that's that's what we're talking about, is transforming relationships, specifically Sarah Gale, um, I, I, I'm so glad we were able to get you on this episode because this is this is your bread and butter. This is where anytime I have a question about relationships, I think about you and and the example that you set with the relationships that you that you share with us at Team 212. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So I am the CEO of Team 212. I, I like to get people together to talk about interesting subjects, and this is one that interests me a lot. Uh, I will say that we have different perspectives. I've been married for 17 years. And, yeah, and, and not only that, but to my high school sweetheart, we met in high school. And she I, she says that I almost got away because I was a senior and she was a, a freshman. I, but anyways, that's another story. Uh, and, and Jeff, your perspective, uh, do you want to share your perspective on relationships? Absolutely. And and I I'm coming to today's podcast, I want to be as much of the student today as I am the head coach for Team 212. I was, I was, uh, I guess I would say, admitting to the group here off mic before we started that, uh, you know, two, I've, I've had two divorces in my past. And so I, you know, I, it's self-reflective for me. I, I, I wonder if it's the, you know, picking the right person. I mean, arguably my two relationships, I was, I was married the first time for 17 years and I was married the second time for seven years. So not flings, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, committed relationships for, for both of those. But um, I wanted to really come today as a student, as much as somebody that can contribute what I've learned. Again, you know, just, just like the, we talk, or at least I say this all the time, like the Bible is a good, book because it has stories on both sides of the equation. It has examples of what you should do and some examples of what you shouldn't. And I feel like I've got a lot of both in my past that I might be able to contribute today. But that's that's me being humble here right in the very beginning of our podcast today. <laughs> yeah. And I, I absolutely think that your perspective is not only welcome, but valuable. Um, it's experience. And, and sometimes when we make mistakes and we 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 and not to say that those are mistakes, but if we hold on to the mistake and not take that lesson from it, um, then we don't grow. So that's what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a couple of, I want to talk about a couple of, um, I don't know if ground rules are the right way. Let's set a foundation. Um, relationships in my mind are the same thing, whether we're talking about a marriage or whether we're talking about a relationship with our parents or with our kids or even with strangers. It's, it, to me, it's more about the relationship that you have with yourself. Because if, if you think about it, there's a lot of nonverbal communication that happens. And, you know, Sarah, I'll let you talk about, you know, maybe some of the research or, or whatever your experience is with nonverbal communication. But in general, when you're we're communicating nonverbally, a lot of it is happening in the recipient's head. And if the recipient's head is full of negative um, feelings about themselves, what they're going to see is negative feelings about themselves from the other person. So I, I think it all starts with 
you, relationships start with your relationship with yourself, um, loving yourself, which is something that I struggled with for a long time. And it took, I read a book called um, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. And in that book, there's an exercise where you, you get in front of the mirror and you look at the mirror and you say, I love myself for five minutes straight. And mm -hmm. when I first read it, I couldn't even do it for 10, for like 10 seconds straight until I got to the point where I could. And that transformation of being able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I love myself without feeling a negative emotion, that is the transformation that we're talking about here. So, so yeah, I wanted to set, set that framework because these relationships really are about universal relationships. But um, I, I don't also want to hear from Sarah Gale because she she knows about the, the actual relationships that matter to us probably we, that we feel like the most, which is our our relationship with our spouse. So what are your thoughts, uh, Sarah Gail, on, on kind of what I talked about with the relationship with yourself and your spouse and how does that work? Yeah, first I just wanna make clear, I am also a student. It, when it comes to relationship, marriage, family, I'm constantly growing, learning alongside all of you. And so just wanna make that clear. Uh, when it comes to your question, Hugo, I think that the common denominator in all of our relationships is ourself. <laughs> So you bring yourself into every relationship, whether it's marriage, children, all of it. And so I think it's important to grow yourself and take that personal responsibility. That's a huge word that I use. It's that personal responsibility, speaking for yourself. I feel, for example, and then having a feeling to that, because a lot of times we'll say, I feel that you're not listening and that's not, there's no feeling there. And then there's blame, right? Whereas speaking more in I feel and then having the, the, the emotion, I feel frustrated because I want to be heard, right? So in that regards, you notice I didn't say you because you is a very accusatory word oftentimes, especially imagine in, in your own lives as you're talking with your partner, it's like if they're saying you did this and you're like, I did not do that or I didn't even, why are you saying I did something I didn't do? And now we're off talking about something different. So a better way I like to say it, and I learned this from my own marriage mentors, because like I said, I'm constantly learning. My husband and I monthly meet with marriage mentors is I desire, I desire whatever. And an example of, of this at all that I think really stands out to a lot of couples I speak to is stereotypically the, the wife might say, I want to go on more dates. It's like, you don't take me on dates is how we say it. You know, when we're upset, you don't take me on any dates We're really if she said, I desire to go on more dates, you're saying the same thing, but the first one is accusatory and can create a fight where the second one is just like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go on more dates. What, what do we need to do to make that happen? So there's small little tweaks that make a big impact. I, I love the perspective of taking personal responsibility and saying, here's how I feel. Mm -hmm. I actually talk about this. I mean, me, me and my wife talk about this too, but I talk about it to my kids because uh, sometimes they feel like they can't express certain emotions. And, and I'm like, and, and I'll say, yeah, if you're angry, I want to know that you're angry. And my kids will say, well, but then I, I do this and, and then it causes problems. And the reality is if we take responsibility for our emotions, anything that happens as a result of our emotions, any lashing out, any words we say, then we can own that and say, oh, okay, I was feeling this emotion. I was feeling frustrated or unheard. And that therefore I lashed out and blamed you. And then now we can we can all take responsibility for our, our emotions and, and our words in that. Because what happens is then people start trying to up the ante on, well, I have something worse to be to griping about. And I no, I have. And now let me bring back stuff that happened, you know, before you were even born, you know. So uh yeah, I, I wanna hear, thank you, Sarah Gale, for that. I, I wanna hear Jeff from you on, on your experience and maybe some situations where this worked. You know, not that not that we always have to focus on what didn't work. When were situations where you were maybe trying to communicate and then you took responsibility of your feelings and were able to move past that, regardless of what the end result was? Sure. And and I can tell you even directly from our from my first marriage, like I was 21 years old when I got married the first time. And, you know, I've been through all kinds of experiences prior to that, mainly the the wartime experience. But. Uh, as far as maturity, and that's, you know, where we started was the know thyself piece. And even though that is a, I would consider more like a signature strength for me today, I look back when I was 21 years old and when I first got married and, and my level of communication 
uh, and that first relationship was was not where it needed to be. I learned so much from my first marriage about me, about who I was and how I was showing up, how I was or wasn't communicating. And I'll tell you, like that, it was a lot me, <laughs> maybe even <clears throat> maybe even mostly me in that first relationship. Um, and looking back now, like I. I learned a lot of those lessons in between that first relationship and my next one about, you know, first of all, it's that know thyself. So, do, you know, how am I showing up in any given conversation or situation? And so today I'm very self-reflective, right? With 53 years of experience under my belt now. So the, the know thyself piece and then the how are you showing up from a communication standpoint? And, and I was... You know, I, I wrote down a couple of, of adjectives, even when Sarah Gale was talking about belief. And so it was the what did I believe was possible in a relationship or, or for me in that first relationship specifically is what did I believe wasn't possible? Right. And I was I was not a great communicator. I wasn't even totally honest. And I don't mean in necessarily like a dishonest way, but I guess, you know, that is what we're talking about. But I wasn't honest with my feelings, how I was feeling about the situation or how I was being treated. And and my example that I had even from my upbringing was very like, you know, stuff it. Right. Like we don't talk like you just talked about using that example with your son and those like we didn't talk about our feelings. And, you know, I never saw my folks argue. I mean, they, they've been married for, you know, 50 plus years now. But I never saw them, you know, argue outwardly. So I didn't even feel like I was necessarily equipped with those skills. And, you know, because it was I was kind of brought up in that, you know, stuff it down nature. We don't talk about our feelings Then I wasn't really equipped to, you know, what I now days called negotiate <laughs> in my relationships. But, you know, part of the negotiations are when you have the disagreement to start with and you end up in not a great place and you have to be able to resolve that. And I think that's that's what I was able to improve myself over the years was figuring out more about myself and it, just as you brought up in the beginning and the, what I believed out of a relationship. So I think that's been a big growth area for me just, just in self-reflection. Um, yeah, communication came up a couple of times, and that is actually one of the things I want to dive deep into. Um, but just kind of starting from the point of being honest with yourself about your own feelings, that that is a huge one. And I don't even know how to unpack that. Sarah Gale, I'm going to ask you for some advice, but uh, I'll, I'll give you my experience that that is very similar to my experience in a way where I um, felt certain ways and I would express it. But beyond like once it, once it, I was able to express it and it wasn't addressed or acknowledged, then I felt like, okay, now it's mine. Now I hold th these emotions because they haven't really been addressed. I express them and I can continue, but then that leads down a negative path. So it, it, it led to me holding on to these emotions, just like you, Jeff. So I came from a different perspective where I thought I could. And it, it was more like I had an expectation that once I expressed my emotions, they would be either, first of all, ad addressed and then, or, or even uh, validated, right? So those are my expe expectations. Which, um, I, Sergey, I want to get your thoughts on those expectations. But beyond those expectations, me having any expectations of the other person beyond just hearing me out is really that, that's on me and my responsibility to say, hey, I want to express myself. But now, how do I handle these emotions? Whether it's talking to Sarah Gale and saying, hey, you know, I, I, I'm expressing myself to my partner, but they're not accepting my my expression of my feelings. What do I do next? That's obviously the right you know, the best way to go is get some help. But in a, in a situation where you're expressing your feelings, maybe you're not being heard. Um, what, how do you communicate that? And this is kind of like a deeper discussion on communication. So you can go at it however you want, but I wanted to kind of put that up in the forefront. Yeah. Wow. There's so much. This is so dynamic when it comes to communication. It's, it's almost like we're, we're looking at some puzzle pieces, but we have like a thousand piece puzzle. And I don't say that to overwhelm anyone. I say it more because 
to, to show the opportunity that we all have to grow in this area of communication. And sometimes it's just a mind shift and looking at things differently than we did before. And so when it comes to, I guess, specifically what you were saying, like being heard, like you might share your, your feelings and then kind of like an expectation is minimally to be heard. I would say, regardless of what your expectation is, that needs to be communicated to your spouse. And so even, even if we go backwards a little bit, first, we need to have self-reflection so that we know what our expectations are and, and we know how we're feeling and really doing. Because like what Jeff said, if we don't have that self-reflection, then we don't even know why we're responding the way we're responding because we haven't spent time with ourselves. And in this busy world, we miss that a lot. But then secondly, if we have some kind of expectation or idea even if it's that I would be heard, we need to communicate that because a lot of times I see in couples and stereotypically is the, the woman just wants to, to kind of vent and be heard. She doesn't need a solution from her husband. Guys, she doesn't always need a solution. She just wants to be heard, but she hasn't made it clear that that is what her expectation is or what she's wanting. And so it's, it's a simple fix. It's just saying, hey, you know, I have some things to share. I just want you to listen. I don't need any advice or anything. I just want to vent. Can you just listen? Done. That She expresses her expectation. And so I think with expectations, we miss that a lot. And then the third step. So first, know what your expectation is. And when I say expectation, I'm meaning more like clarity points. I'm not meaning entitlement by any means. Um, I'm more like, let's get clear on what we're thinking and then let's seek our spouse out about, are they in agreement? And so it's it's first being aware, and then second, making your spouse aware and seeking their agreement on that expectation. But then the third is the details. What are the details that, that go with that expectation? For, so for example, if I'm saying, hey, can you take out the trash? And I get agreement from my husband, he says, yes, I got you, babe, I'll take out that trash. But then we don't talk about, okay, when does the trash go out? at what point do I want the trash out? Then we're still fighting when I walk down stairs and I see the trash is overflowing. Whereas he's thinking, I take it out in the evening and I'm thinking, you lazy bum, right? But we didn't talk about the details. And that happens a lot when it comes to relationship. There's, there's, there's so much. It's, it's so fun to talk about because there's, there's so much that we can do to communicate better. You, um, you can't waste plastic. And if you take the garbage out before the end of the day, you might waste plastic because you're going to throw it out again. So I understand. I understand. <laughs> you see how you could get caught up though? Like we think we're in agreement, but we didn't talk about those details. And now we're fighting again. Whereas we just need to be clear on those details when we're agreeing to things. One of the things I want to point out about everything you said is it actually all also applies, I mean, obviously to all relationships, but specifically I'm thinking to like at work, your relationships with your managers, with your coworkers, directors, like setting, like being clear about your expectations and your feelings. And you, you mentioned clarity points. I love that. I love that because that changes the reason for your, you know, when you're communicating, you're, you're communicating for clarity, which is something people want mm -hmm. versus, you know, even being heard. Sometimes people don't, don't want to listen. You know, yeah. uh, sometimes I don't, I'm not, I'm not ready to listen right now. <clears throat> and that's, that's valid, you know, uh, to be honest, like I've been in situations where I feel a certain way and I can hear you, but I'm not ready to listen yet. Mm -hmm. But if you tell me, Hey, I just want to give you clarity, then I'm listening for clarity. And I think that's a, that's a huge one that I want to highlight. Any thoughts, Jeff? Um, and, 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 you know, even, even thinking about other relationships where, where, where this plays, especially as a leader. Um, where these tactics play, do you have any I feel like they're totally universal. So all the things that we've been talking about, the you know, the first one I have on my list is the know thyself. Number two on my list is communication. And we've talked about setting really clear expectations. We've talked about using the details. And then Sarah Gale talked about getting agreement, right? Or what I would call buy-in in business sense, right? And so those things are universal for negotiating business, being a good leader, or what we're talking about right here. And that's, that's what life is about is relationships, right? And so, again, we are talking a lot about intimate relationships here today, because that's one of the most, you know, short of probably the relationships that you have with your children, you know, the most intimate relationships that you can have in your life as, as, a, as a partner. But 
again, all of these principles, at least the principles that we've talked about thus far are, I think, universal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we can talk about more communication strategies. Uh, I, I think I want to go into to empathy and talk about empathy specifically, but uh, I think about empathy in, in multiple ways. One way is like, do you have empathy for what I'm going through? Right. That's that's one thing. But then there's also, do you have empathy for my perspective? And perspective has more to do has to do with more than just what you're going through in the moment. Perspective has to do with everything I've gone through. And to be honest, everything everyone in my lineage has gone through like that's perspective. Um, so. So, yeah, the role of empathy and perspective in relationships. Um, Sarah Gale, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So I'm like, of course I do. <laughs> so I think it, it depends on how we're looking at it. So if, if you, you're saying, kind of speaking from your, your own experience, getting, gaining empathy from our, are we talking about spouse still? Yeah, and I'll give you an example. I'll give you a clear example. Uh, this is actually has to do with my parents. My dad grew up in Mexico in, uh, he, he lived the ranch life. So he, you know, he, he had the type of uh, life where as a kid, you wake up, you feed the animals, you take care of the ranch. And if you don't do this stuff that needs to be done, you don't eat. And if you don't eat, you don't live and you die <laughs> and you die. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, <laughs> but um, my mom grew up, uh, you know, closer to the border and she was kind of in the city life. And, and, you know, yes, you have to work to eat, but it was a different type of work. I mean, she, she did labor work, but it's just different, disconnected from the actual food that you're bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And to me, those two perspectives play a huge role in how they see everything about what should be done, what shouldn't be done. You know, the taking out the trash, that, that's a perspective that I gave of like, well, what about, what about the plastic? And maybe not, not a perspective that you may be thinking about. So that's kind of what I mean where, you know, in the moment we may say something and there's a lot behind that. And we can't, I can't communicate all this every time I ask to take out the trash, right? But how, how, what are some effective ways of communicating perspective to have empathy? Yeah, I think a huge thing to consider is that you're on the same team with your spouse, because if you're on the same team, you are going to naturally come alongside rather than against. And so when you come alongside, then you can start to see things how they see things. I give this example on sessions all the time. And I don't know, is this a, an, audio, an audio or do people, is this a visual? Visual. Okay. So I give this example where I'm talking to a couple and I say, okay, what do you see? What do you guys see? I see Micah. Yeah, I see your son's name. Are you kidding me? You don't see the sunshine or the heart or the rose? <laughs> no, we don't. Okay, because I do. And so, and I've, I think I've given this at Toastmasters before, this kind of concept. So the point is, a lot of us in, in relationship, and even with our kids, to be honest, it's like, hey, what are you talking about? Are you even, are you trying? Are you even listening to me? You're not even because this is what I'm seeing and I'm so convinced. And so rather than get so adamant about what I'm seeing, it's like, I already know what I see. What I'm curious to know is why do you see what you see? And because I'm on your team, I'm going to come around side that paper and I'm going to look through your lens. So I think that's a huge point of empathy as far as recognizing, first of all, they are a completely different person. And so we can't expect them to do things. This is, this is one of the things we do in relationships. We say, if it was me, I would have done this or any decent person would do that, that, but in reality, it is not you and you do what you do because you are you and they are completely different. And there's actually strength in the differences, because if we can learn to work together and see both sides, then where I'm only able to see my side, you see your side together, we're more holistic. And so we have to start seeing these differences as strengths because we're curious rather than judgmental and suspicious. Uh, you, you used the word curious and, and used it a couple of times. And that's one of my favorite words, curious, because yeah. it really transforms everything. Uh, you know, the thing about being on the same team, that's my wife, Crystal, she actually uses that one often and reminds me too, because she says, she'll say we're on the same team. Like she'll remind herself and her saying it reminds me we are on the Team. We're, we're trying to accomplish the same goal, honestly, like mm -hmm. there's similar goals. We have our own, you know, uh, own objectives, but in, in reality, the same goal. Um, what are, what, what have you noticed has worked the most 
to transition from someone who and a, a couple who doesn't see that teamwork or that aspect of it to a couple that does, what mm -hmm. are some tactics that have, have helped the most? I think, and maybe this is more of a mindset. Mindset's huge. On Sometimes we just become aware of something and it changes everything. So assumptions, getting rid of assumptions, because when we start to assume that, oh, he just thinks this of me, or she, she just thinks that, and we don't actually ask, what are you actually thinking? Then, then that that's detrimental because a lot of times when that happens in a session, I'll ask the, the person point blank, is that what you think? And they'll say, no, it's not what I think. And so it goes back to that ownership, that personal responsibility, as far as like, I'm responsible for what I think they're responsible for what they think. If I want to know what they think rather than assume, I'm just going to ask them. And I think on the other end of this, it's not expecting our spouse to pry it out of us how like it's like they should just know no they it just because your spouse doesn't know that you need to be hugged in that moment or that you need your space in that moment doesn't mean they're less in tune with you or they don't care about you it just means we need to be take personal responsibility be assertive with what we can use in that moment if you'd like a hug ask for a hug it's great if they are intuitive, but I, I encourage couples not to hold it against the other person if they're intuitive, if they're not intuitive, because then we get into this codependency thing where it's like, hey, let's just say what we mean and mean what we say and and move forward together. And that just it just makes it so much easier. So I'm not sure if that answers your your empathy question, it but does. I will say one thing I do on sessions also that's very powerful is I have the couple look at each other right there in the session. And it's, it's so funny because I, I, I might thrive in awkward moments, maybe, maybe. Uh, and so they look, they're looking at each other and I talk them through this empathy um, statement, if you will. And I'll say, you're looking at someone who has hopes and dreams, just like you. You're looking at someone who is here, they're present because they want to grow just like you. And so I'll say different things. And then I'll say, so let's give that person throughout this process of counseling, let's give them empathy, just like you would want to receive empathy. And so I try to get them to kind of, I first of all, make eye contact, which most couples don't do consistently, number one, but then secondly, to really see and understand that how they feel is how their spouse is, you know, in their own way is feeling. And in this moment, it's powerful because a lot of the couples, they start to cry. Um, sometimes you see they feel awkward staring at each other because like I said, couples don't do that a lot of times, but it's extremely powerful. That is exactly what I was looking for. I'm glad that you, you brought that up because yeah, that, that, that's like a snap out of it type of exercise mm -hmm. that, I mean, I felt even just thinking about that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for for that. And if if uh, to be honest, if you could do a recording of that, I would love to give that to people because I think that's something you just listen to and ask. Like anybody, you look at this person and what they're going through. You, we we have no idea what they're going through, but they have the same ambitions and aspirations. So, um, sounds like a tool. Yeah, it sounds like a tool. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I am going to ask you to to bring up your tool, but before we get into it, uh, any any thoughts on empathy? On any and you can relate it to leadership in any way, but thoughts on empathy. Well, I, I want to use how Sarah Gale turned that. So you, Hugo, you mentioned your example of perspective and you wanted people to be able to feel your, and the feelings that you were feeling, right? And be, I don't know if you use the word validated, but you wanted people to like get your perspective. And I love how Sarah Gale turned it around. And I, that was a powerful tool in and of itself that she held up with the picture that her son drew, right? And she used the example of, well, what does one person see from their perspective versus another? And we haven't mentioned, you know, books and things of that nature yet of, of you know, people that have been impactful, but, you know, the, the maybe it was the only <laughs> book that I've ever read on relationships, but it was really, really powerful for me was the five love languages. And I really started thinking about that, like, when you started mentioning, you know, Sarah Gale mentioned taking out the trash and then you mentioned, well, but, you know, I want to be efficient with the plastic and I want to be wasteful and all that. And you could just use that seemingly innocuous example of taking out the trash and how different people. And that's what like I felt almost like the scales were being peeled back from my eyes 
when I read that book the first time and I was like, oh, wow. I, I mean, I didn't even realize that I had these love languages. Sarah Gale also used the example of, you know, do I need a hug, right? And some people are touchy like that and they want the tactile, they need a hug. And then there's other people kind of like me who are not, you know, that kind of affection in that nature, but I still like to hold hands and things of that nature. So it's, I think what you, what we heard Sarah Gale saying, I think is so powerful. It's being able to communicate like what, what feels good to me, or if other people are doing things that irritate me, like when the trash is full and that irritates me, it's like, well, I'd rather just say it out loud that that's irritating to me. And then we can start the negotiation from there. So anyway, that that's just what I was kind of thinking on based on what you guys were just kind of pitching and catching there. Yeah, um, the, the, the five love languages, I felt similarly when I read that. It's a book that describes five different ways that people communicate and and accept love best. And and Sergio, I want to get your thoughts on that book too, because it is something I recommend everybody read in for all relationships, because it helps you understand how you can reward yourself. Like um, the, the five love languages are words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, quality time, and then physical touch. And one of my big ones is the words of affirmation. And so the, one of the great things about the love, five love languages is you can use that on yourself. If I know that words of affirmation are, are powerful for me, then I will use words of affirmation in tough situations where I'm struggling. That's so I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Sarah Gell, go ahead. I was going to say, I like gifts. And he go, so part of the accountability of Team 212 is we set these goals. And so I had a goal of not drinking coffee for a month. And my reward was buying a new dress. And so it's like, I use that on myself, like you're saying. When it comes to the five love languages, I think they're phenomenal because it gives language for things that we don't typically have language for. So it makes it clear couples have been able to grab hold of something that is important to them as far as this is how I like to receive love. And then we've become aware of the fact that how, how because we are different, how we love someone might be different than how they how they receive love. And so love languages helps identify, okay, even though I might be gifts, my husband is words of affirmation. So I'm not going to just give him gifts. He probably won't care about the gifts. And so then you don't get that appreciation. And so that's where we have that, that clash, but he will care about words. And so it's just really coming alongside the other, the other person. There are a couple areas though. I just want people to be aware of when it comes to words of affirmation, because this is what I do. And so I'm very much inundated in it and everything is deeper than it seems. And so when it comes to words of affirmation, it is just an example. But with with your spouse, all that matters is that you know your spouse, not that in general, we know people. It's what does your spouse want? So even you, Hugo, it's like words of affirmation. It would be, okay, what does that look like? Because we could say, oh, he likes words of affirmation and just I can tell you random stuff. But it's like there might be something even as we narrow down. Hey, I love to hear pertaining to the kids, you know, how, how I'm being a good father or whatever. But it's getting more specific acts of service. What does that look like? Oh, when you do the dishes, that's amazing. Because then you have practical, clear things that you can do that are wins. And you just you can even have a list of like this is what my spouse says matters to them. But then the other thing I want people to be aware of is that it's it's crucial to have accountability because I have counseled couples who are on the verge of divorce because of the five love languages, because they went through and they took the time to learn the five love languages. But then they one of the spouses fell off. And all of a sudden, it's, it's as if you go, you tell Crystal, okay, words of affirmation. You guys are excited. You do the test. Oh, words of affirmation. Great. So Crystal starts telling you, you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. And then after two weeks, she stops. And let's say it brought life to your marriage. And now after two weeks, you're like, oh, nothing has changed. She just went back to how she normally is. So then you feel even more hopeless because you're like, see, she doesn't care. Whereas in reality, it's not about that. It's just about accountability. Maybe Crystal needed a better accountability system so that she could remember because we forget what we don't inspect, if you will. And so sometimes with couples, they get very frustrated, but really it's just, we need accountability to do the things we wanna do for our spouse. We will forget unless we have that accountability and unless we really start to change it at that 
um, more deeper level of our belief system. That's when we start to be someone different rather than do something different. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's been, it's actually, it, it dovetails directly into a, a subject that I want to get into, which is when one, one person is, 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 let's say, improving themselves or working on the, the relationship, and then the other person maybe isn't, or maybe they are, but it doesn't look like it. Um, I want to dive deep into that subject, uh, but but first I want to talk about the the lo five love languages and yeah, like not feeling like it's like hey we're we are doing this we're both trying this and at a certain point now I feel like I'm putting more into this relationship than you are and that could be a misconception or just an assumption like you said letting go of assumptions um, and, and it could just be like hey this this five love languages it's just a little bit harder for me mm -hmm. so in situations like that where Maybe you have a couple and, and, you know, there could be something as, as dr dramatic as, you know, w one couple having a completely different lifestyle or one, one um, person in the relationship wanting a completely different lifestyle than, than the other and saying, well, we're, we're not on the same page. That's like an extreme version or just, hey, I'm, I'm getting up a little bit earlier and you're sleeping in and it's causing like a, a rift in, in the, the balance of the relationship. How, how do you see couples navigate that uh, effectively? Yeah, I think, I think it's understanding what I try and tell couples is you can't control the other person, nor, nor do you want to. And so it goes back, this is the key phrase to personal responsibility. Like if you want to get up early, that's what you want to do. Yeah. As spouses, like let's support one another. And when we get married, we're not our own, we're not on our own anymore. So let's not be like jerks, if you will. And let's, let's be agreeable to, to our spouse and help whenever we can. But at the same time, we can't make our spouse do something just because we want, we want to do it or we think they should be doing it. And so I think this is the hardest thing in marriage to understand because you can share Hugo, like you said before, like you can share, this is like, I just want to be validated or you, you, you're growing and they're not. And so it feels like it's unbalanced. But I tell couples, there's this scripture in James, and it's like, as long as you know the good that you are to do and you don't do it, it's sin for you. So whether you believe in sin or not, it's missing the mark for you because either you're a person of integrity that does what you know to do regardless of the circumstance or you're not. So just because your spouse isn't treating you a certain way or how you feel like they should be treating you, I don't believe that justifies us withholding or treating them in a similar way. Because if we know the good we are to do, we do it regardless. And the, that's the vulnerability in relationship because you can't control what they're gonna do. All you can do is continue to be the best version of yourself. And we know that the best scenario for relationship is to give, right? To, to honor, to serve. And so regardless of if we're getting that back, we know that that's the best thing to do. But whether you're spiritual or not, there is a concept of you reap what you sow. And so I'm also a firm believer as the more we pour out, the more we will get back in some way or another. So, yeah. 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 I, I, it, I think I related to be the example also like be, being the, if, if you, if you feel, if one feels like they are uh, doing something and the other person isn't, and maybe you, 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 I love what you said. You shouldn't want to control them. Right. Maybe you see like, hey, this is a better way for you. Maybe maybe you're thinking, well, I want to improve myself because if you see that I'm improving myself, then you hopefully it'll motivate you to improve yourself. But I can't control that. And and if you so, you know, this actually comes back to a deeper concept, which is unconditional love mm -hmm. and unconditional love. It's in the name. There are no conditions, whether you're on at the best of your days and, and, and thriving or if you're at the rock bottom of your of your life and you need some support, that's what unconditional love is. And if you have that, which, you know, maybe that's one of the baseline things to work on is, do I have unconditional love? Then you can, the, the, you know, honestly, over, over in, endure anything in that mm -hmm. situation. Jeff, do you have any, any thoughts uh, before we get into your tool? I want to ask you about the tool of the week. I'm surprised. I don't know. Usually I will, I'll, I'll at least know a little bit. I want to know, but any thoughts before we get to that point? I just want to launch right into the tool now. <laughs> all right, let's get, Sarah Gale's got me all fired up. Let's get yeah. into it. So my my tool is deliberate and intentional 
time together. And so again, like I talked about before, some of these these themes are universal. We, we talked about communication, for example, being a, a real fundamental piece of this relationship equation, but we also talked about how fundamental that is to any kind of relationship, if you're a boss or a leader, or team leader, anything like that. So carving out, here's the two words I wanna use, which are deliberate and intentional time together, right? And so the time frame that I love to use for intimate relationships like this is weekly. So weekly is, you know, obviously a, a culmination of any seven days, right? And so even busy professionals, and I've been that um, in my relationships where both spouse, myself and my wife was busy professionals and they had, you know, a lot going on in their life and we had children on both sides. We had grandchildren, we had all kind, you know, travel and all these things that were going on. But one of the most effective things that I've ever found is when you create time deliberately. And so we had a philosophy and, you know, we were sometimes better at this and sometimes not as good where we got together on a weekly basis that worked well for us, like when we would have a meal together and we would make it really intentional. We'd say, hey, you know, on that Thursday night, you know, next Thursday, let's just go out for a meal together and let's just talk. Let's talk about, you know, how things are going. You know, it, I'm not going to espouse, you know, like what tools you use, but there's several great examples of making sure that you talk through for, for our relationship. It always worked really well because we were so busy where we talked about what our calendars were and what we had coming up. And because we were traveling together, we would get together and put things on our calendar like, hey, this is a weekend that we're going away to Sedona or we're taking that trip to Mexico or any of these kind of things. And you can have fun when you're planning these things out and planning your travel. But when you have an intentional and deliberate practice that you're doing weekly and weekly is like the outside, right? I mean, I think again, you listen to whatever, you know, whatever expert you want on like physical intimacy, but how much, you know, intimate time do you have with your partner where you're either, you know, setting the clock and, and we're going to bed and we're retiring and, you know, there's no more TV and there's no more digital distractions. There's just us and it's couples time, right? But there's some frequency on a weekly basis where I believe that's, necessary, right? So physical intimacy, conversations, intimate conversations, things of that nature. But I really believe that if you don't have something that boils down to pretty close to weekly, and it's there's nothing magic about weekly, although there is something magic about weekly, of getting together intentionally and creating time where there's open conversation. And again, we haven't used this word, but you know, where it's like a safety zone where you, you know, it, it, maybe it's a little bit back to that know thyself, right? So if you open yourself up and you ask, you know, really good questions like, hey, honey, <laughs> what have I said or what have I done in the last week that, you know, really irked you and you kept it to yourself? If you share that with me, maybe I can look to be more aware when that happens. Or what is, you know, something that I did this week that you really appreciated that I might not even be aware of. And when you're communicating more openly and deliberately in this way, I think it's it's really the, the predecessor, the precursor to open communication and dialogue about the future and what's working and what's not and things of that nature. So some brand of, of weekly, deliberate, intentional, conversation and then again followed by whatever level of you know intimacy works in your in your relationship yeah i i wrote down ritual and then one, one of the phrases that really i i've used this recently and it summarizes what you said is face-to-face -face time doing things you both enjoy and uh, so building a ritual with face-to-face -face time doing things you both enjoy I love that tool. Thank you, Jeff, for bringing that to us. Sarah Gale, um, you know, are, is there any, are, are there any tools? You gave us a bunch, so you don't feel like you need to, but there, are there any tools that come to mind that you're like, hey, this is an, a bonus or anything you want to give to the audience? 
Well, I just kind of wanted to re reiterate what Jeff just talked about, because I feel like that was beautifully stated as emotional intimacy. It's like a lot of couples come to me and they say, we just, I just don't feel emotionally connected. And so a huge way to grow that in your marriage is exactly what you talked about being intentional. And I like the word intentional because a lot of times we'll like watch a movie with our spouse, but that's not building any kind of intimacy. It's not at the end of the movie. I don't know anything new about you. I don't know what you're concerned about, what you're excited about. I don't know anything about you. Right. And so, sure, you can watch a movie, but as far as what what grows a relationship and that emotional intimacy are those deeper questions as far as like, how's your heart? Like what, like exactly what Jeff said. So I thought that was great. And then the other thing is recognizing, you know, I was, I was recently listening to this pastor, his name's Erwin McManus and he talks, he's brilliant. And he talks about how he coaches and consults with, you know, high level executives, athletes, all of these different types of people. And what he has found is they can be tremendous at what they do, you know, as far as their profession. But then when it comes to personal, their personal life, it, you know, there is, there are multiple divorces. Oh, ow, gosh. I use my hands too much. Um, multiple divorces, just multiple, just, you know, different, I guess, I don't know the actual word I'm looking for, but just it's, it's challenging. The personal aspect relationships are extremely challenging. And these people are brilliant minds in their professions. And the reason is it doesn't always translate the skills that we use in one arena aren't going to necessarily translate to an intimate relationship. And I think the sooner we know that the better, because it really does impact our expectation. Because if we expect we're this powerful person in one field, and so we expect that same respect and honor, and we speak and you listen at home, that's not going to go well. And we might be more of a tyrant to our, our kids and our wife rather than, you know, a loving husband and, and vice versa. That's a, that's a, I'm glad you, you took time to say that because that's a really important point. Thank you, Sarah Gail. Uh, it, it's been amazing, insightful. I think one of the most jam-packed, informative sessions that we've had. Uh, you're welcome back back anytime, Sarah Gail. Don't don't worry about feeling like you're always here because it's it's you're bringing value for sure. Um, it's it's you know I think talking about communication, talking about empathy, and then even the foundations of relationships it is just the start. So if people want to get in touch with you, Sarah Gail, how can they get in touch with you? They can. I would say maybe email if you actually want to get in touch with me, email would be the best, which I should have had the email, but that's my website. If you actually want help with your marriage, there's a big red button on that website and you just click it. It says schedule a free consultation. You'll get me or my wonderful husband, most likely, or maybe someone else. I don't know who you'll get, but you can do it that way. But if you want to reach out directly to me, just email me. It's Sarah with an H Gail, but there's no hyphen. And then it's at hope relentless.com. Sarah Gail at uh, hoperlentless.com. And if you want to check out the, the information about your program, it's hoperlentless.com. That's right. But awesome. Thank you, Sarah Gail. Next week, we're going to be talking about reflecting on 2023. This has been my biggest year. I, I, I'm going to save it all for, for next week, but I want to share some of the big wins from the year, some of the lessons that I've had to learn and my, you know, I guess we won't get into the vision for 2024, but yeah, let's talk, talk about 2023. We'll see you next week.